see us. This wonderful little aerial was just taken a few days ago. This is our uh, meeting we just had in Rapid City. So now that people buy all these cool drones, this is the drone shot of our group as we're uh, getting ready. I'll wait a moment till this uh, ends, but it was, uh, we were in Rapid City last week, and in the end here you'll see a group photo pop up. The group uh, CIOS Committee on Earth Observation Satellites is a international organization that includes space agencies, as well as uh, associate members. They're non-space agencies, but interested in Earth observations and satellite data. So there's now a uh, 50 plus organizations in there and flying over 150 satellites. We get together multiple times a year. There's multiple groups within CIOS, and the focus is on promoting the use of the satellite data and coming together on collaborative projects. So uh, last, last week was just our big uh, meeting. There's quite a few people in that picture that will be here this week as well. So what is changing? There are, uh, I'm always asked, you know, why are we doing this DataCube initiative and what is the environment behind this that's been driving it? So I categorize it in these, these four areas. We're seeing free and open data. Everybody knows since the Landsat data came in uh, 2007, I believe is when it was released. <laughs> to now the Sentinel data, we have a flood of data and a flood of free and open data and open tools. Global engagement has been ever increasing. So with internet technology and cooperation, we're seeing more there. Uh, philanthropy, we all know about Google Earth Engine and we know what's happening with world banks and the foundations. And then finally, the technology. There's things that we can now do with cloud-based computing and technology and cloud storage that we couldn't do five, ten years ago. So all of this points towards some new ideas and new concepts, which is the focus of this talk in data cubes. So uh, Pilar, you're going to like this because this was done just for you in Colombia. So this is fresh data on the left-hand side, thanks to Sean. We went back through the archive and said, what does the data look like in Colombia for just Landsat and Sentinel? Of course, Sentinel wasn't around until 2014. But this was all the data that was available for <coughs> Columbia, and look at the difference in just the last couple of years and what's going to happen in 2018. So the problem is no longer that I can't get the data, the problem is, well, that's probably still the problem. It's that the data is not available at all. Now the problem is we have all kinds of free data and we really don't have great mechanisms to get it into their hands and start to use it. So it's a tenfold problem for Columbia because just a couple years ago, they were getting maybe a terabyte a year. Now it's roughly 10 terabytes a year. And they would sure like to use that data from what we're told. So we're trying to help figure out solutions that will allow this to happen. And those solutions are what we call the, the data cube. So learning, accessing this data is, is the key to all of this. So let's talk about what the cubes are. Many of you may Know, know what these are, and others may have no idea what a data cube is, but think about it as the traditional scenes that we have contain information at pixel level, really small bits of information, 10 meter, 20, 30 meter resolution. Those pixels are typically all in these scenes. So if you download a Landsat scene, it's 185 kilometers square, and then these are time slices that you gather over time. But this is an inefficient way to deal with data, individual scenes, trying to splice them together, trying to do time series analysis. If I could pull all the pixels out of these scenes and then stack them into this thing we call a data cube, far more efficient for us to do it and to use it and to exploit it. Proven concept in Australia. Um, Stuart Minchin will tell you it works quite nicely there. They, they have a new program, Digital, Digital Earth Australia, just funded for over $15 million. And so, they're, they're probably the largest, uh, absolutely the largest uh, demonstration of what a data cube can do for a country. And I would say next in line is likely Colombia and Switzerland who have really made tremendous progress in doing this. So come to those other sessions and you'll, you'll hear how they've experienced it. The key for all of this is open source software. We want this entire project to be free and available to everybody so that you can use it whenever you want. You can use the, the algorithms and all the processes but the intent here was to take the successes of what Australia did and now to globalize the infrastructure. How can I take it to any other country in the world and make it work? 
And that's, that's our challenge, and that's what we're trying to do with this project in CIOS. So CIOS saw this experience in Australia, and a group of us within the organization said, why not take this and make it globally available to everyone? Now, it's a slightly different adaptation of what they did in Australia, because they did some things with the data and how they managed the data, because they're using a supercomputer, but we knew the rest of the world doesn't necessarily have a supercomputer. So in that case, slightly different uh, approach. So what are, the, what are the benefits? We firmly believe we'll expand the use of satellite data with cubes. We know that we're going to rec uh, decrease the data preparation. There's a seat here, another one over in the back. Standing room only. I love this. <laughs> and the man of the hour just walked in, Trevor Dew. I'm going to combine multiple data sets. So how can I use optical data from Landsat and radar data from Sentinel-1 all together at one place? And the way we do that nicely is to do that within a data cube because we can stack it and spatially align these. And then when I look down through one pixel in time, I may see a radar scene, an optical, uh, a radar pixel, an optical pixel, and there, there's uh, a lot of advantages to doing that. Free and open access I already mentioned. Flexible deployment. I can do this locally. In the case of Colombia, it's local. In the case of um, uh, Switzerland, it's locally deployed on a computer of their choice within country. There are other uh, cases, and I think in, in Miguel's case, they're looking at doing this on the cloud. Either way is an acceptable way to do it. It's just how you install it and deploy it and get it running. And it, once the user interacts with it, the user doesn't really know where that data resides. It could be on the cloud, it could be in the local computer, that doesn't really matter. That same algorithm could be used in Switzerland and Australia if they want to. And so that's the commonality there. And we want it to be a community development. So we don't want to be selling a tool or, or giving it out. We're not trying to push a technology on anybody. We really want this to be a solution. Um, I mentioned to a few of you before I got started, if you have any questions, during the talk. Uh, I'd love to hear them, so raise your hand and I'll answer them on the fly, and if I can't, others will be able to answer them. So we have this, this grand vision of where this all can go, and this is where it, it, in my mind, gets pretty exciting for the potential. So we know that this helps see our satellite data get in the hands of more users. We know that this can help the agenda of GEO and the United Nations and their agendas. Satellite uh, CIOS agencies are interested in this because their, their data products can get out there and they can, they can focus on, on solutions. We're focused on making sure that the customer experience is a good one. So Pilar will tell you and Greg will tell you, we try our very best to communicate with them and to solve their problems and to help them along because <laughs> this whole process would not be successful if we just threw some technology at the countries and said, here it is, it's great, go use it. That's not really going to help us. So what we're trying to do in this process is do our best to build the trust, help out the community, bring the community along, and then I think with time, this is going to organically grow, and I expect it to be something that uh, we'll, we'll trust. So the last one is where it gets interesting. So a year ago, I had to think up a target that would get everybody uh, thinking, ah, oh, we can't do this, this is going to be a huge target. So I said, how about 20 countries in the next five years? Well, most people look at me like I was crazy, but when you see where we are now, it's really remarkable. I think we're going to get there. I really think we're going to get there. I, I predict we're going to have eight countries with operational data cubes by the end of 2018. So we're almost there, and that's just a year and a half. So I, I'm, I'm sure Australia is happy to see this because their goal in the very beginning of this was, hey, we've got this incredible technology that's working well. Why can't we get this somewhere else in the world? And so it's, it's coming. Now, World Bank, Google, Amazon, we're working with them because they're a key to getting us connections to the countries and also possibly providing some funding and some, some mechanisms to make this all happen. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're interacting with those groups and how they can help us. So where have we gone so far? There's a, a nice website out there, opendatacube.org. Um, you can go there and check it all out. We have spent a lot of time in the past few months bringing this uh, together and, and coming up with some pretty nice content. 
So we have two different groups. We have a partners group and a steering group that manage the initiative at the highest level. So the partners group are the founders and the, and the funders of the, of the um, a group. So my office here is the NASA SEO, Geoscience Australia, CSIRO is having regular meetings and discussing what is the strategy behind how we move forward and solve problems. And then there's also a steering group behind this and the steering group is more technically involved in managing the code and the open source repository. And that's, you know, they're, they're more in the, in the technical side of things. So when you go to the website, you will see strategic white papers. There's a, there's a nice little two pager out there that says, here's what we want to do. I'm telling it all to you today, pretty much the content of what's in the white paper. We had a conference, uh, a uh, workshop at IGARS last summer. Uh, in, in Texas, we're going to do another one next year in Valencia, Spain. And the, the intent of the workshops is some more hands-on. So what we're going to do tomorrow afternoon with a little hands-on demo, the, wor the workshop that we do at iGARS is much longer. So it's uh, about four or five hours long. We're going to put a little lunch in the middle. But the idea is to bring people in, give them hands-on experience, and perhaps that might be the next country that takes the data cube and, and installs it and deploys it. And that's, <coughs> that's my hope. So now we get near the end. We are interacting already with more than 30 countries. And here's what that, oh, it'll come in a minute. I think I have a, I have a nice global chart coming up. So let me tell you about these. There's this um, lingo that we use out there between Open Data Cube and what we're doing in CIOS. You may hear them when people are talking, sort of using them interchangeably, but there is a difference I want you to be aware of. So Open Data Cube we see as the very top of this architecture. It is the place where we want to have community involvement, and any organization can be part of Open Data Cube if they want to be a contributor. If they want to be a real contributor, like a funder, and really investing in infrastructure, and, and that they might become part of the partners at the top, but they can contribute code and be part of this. That's what Open Data Cube is. Now, a step lower than that would be any group that takes the Open Data Cube and does an implementation of that. So in the CIOS case, the way we're taking it out to countries is what we're calling CIOS Data Cube. We're taking a portion of the open data cube structure, which is most of it, basically, but adapting it so that we can focus on developing countries and get this in the hands of, of people that are non-traditional users, is what I like to, to call them. Because if you think about it, the, the, the power scientists and the power users around the world, the, the larger developed countries, most of these people really know how to use data quite easily. This is not a huge problem for them. Now, the data cube may give them some advantages, but I think the enormous advantage comes in for the developing world because these are the users that need help and they need a better way to deal with data, and this is where I think we can help. So that's the CIOS data cube. You're going to hear from Stuart this afternoon about the Digital Earth Australia. That is the Australian implementation, and there's some differences. Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, Francesco Gattani from UN Environment, UNAC. I have a question on the users. Would it be possible for expert users to, uh, to assimilate or upload external data in this architecture? I mean, non-satellite data, like climate models, meteorological models? Absolutely. Geospatial so, data at large. So any put into a raster format, right? Rasterized, or think about the fact that if I've got Landsat data, it has spatial dimension and time dimension, right? That's my block. But if I have climate data in there, the climate data may be taken at various time intervals, and it might be spatially uh, located. And so within the cube construct, you can take a piece of climate data that might be 500 you know, meter uh, separation, and then you can put Landsat pixels stacked within that climate data. And now it's all aligned. The key to it becomes, how do I spatially align it? And then I also have the time dimension too. But absolutely, we can pull so the source that data. Is available. Well, from my basic idea for GCI Revolutions coordinator, um, in the evolution of uh, GEOS uh, and evolution of the GCI, we see the interoperability with the data cubes as a part of the picture in the evolution. So this is something that is not operational yet. We are very keen to make this, uh, this step uh, a concrete step. Good. So is this in the, how, how do you see this uh, being possible with the test case we have the great 
proximity with the University of Geneva. Mm -hmm. uh, we could leverage uh, this spatial proximity to start exploring interoperability. Or how do you, do you have any other any yeah. advice? So I've thought about it a, a bit and within GEO because, <laughs> you know, GCI and how they've connected so many different uh, data sets and products and things, how does this fit into that? Um, it's, it's a slight bit different, and right now I don't have that perfect solution on how to make that work. But I think between us, we can probably explore some interesting ways to do it. So Stuart, I'd love, to hear, I'd love to hear a solution. So, um, keep the resources, four million resources available in, um, in the, the, um, the, um, the portal. Um, the Geo Portal. 400 million, 400 million sorry. Uh, four, <laughs> 400 million resources available. Um, but finding those resources, often those resources are, are as you said, scenes. You know? So actually, what are you going to do with them? How do you actually translate that into information? So the Data Cube is a uh, construct that allows you to utilise the GCI to go and find the data that you're going to load into the Data Cube. Uh, and that doesn't only have to be satellite data, it can be you know, digital elevation models, it can be you know, hydro hydrology um, information, a whole range of other things. Then you generate a product, a decision ready product from the data cube infrastructure, which might be a map of water extent or, or change detection. Those products should also be re, uh, you know, connected into the GCI so that other people can discover the products as well. So I think there's a, a real need to, to connect the two. I think they're completely uh, complementary. Um, but at the moment, the GCI is about discovery and, uh, and download, if you like. It's not about analysis yet. Um, and this gives you the analysis engine that connects to it. So. Up there and say, I need this Landsat or Sentinel data over this little spatial spot for this time period. And it goes and creates the analysis ready data, or maybe it's already analysis ready and creates my cube for me, I can either download that cube or do analysis in the cloud. And that, that resolves a lot of data transfer. And I, I'm hoping we get to that point. And also the other thing we found is when the cube is created, we're seeing more than five times compression for most of the cases. So you've already now, if you're gonna download data, why download scenes? If, I, if I'm gonna download anything, I'd like to download cubes because they're probably six, seven times compressed. Is the data cube primarily, uh, at this point in time anyway, a, a, a kind of a data storage framework, or do you have a vision, particularly working with the likes of Amazon and Google, to turn this into a, a kind of an information source? Because I can see if you link this to kind of machine learning, then you can you ping this thing with a question, uh, and it will give you the inform the answers you need, not a whole bunch of raster data sets. Okay. Sounds like Stuart talking. Yeah, That's exactly. exactly what you'll you'll see that this afternoon. Okay. And people like Australia <coughs> is, is exactly that machine learning. Uh, delivering product. We've done some, uh, we had a student last summer do a machine learning algorithm with uh, some of the cube work. I, in, the, in the perfect world, the vision you've just stated is where we want to go. Absolutely, that's what we'd like to see. So it's a, ma it's a matter of how do you get all these um, data systems to kind of speak together? How do you take best advantage of the cloud computing that's all over the world? And I think in time, we're going to head in that direction. But the real value is, can we all speak an architecture that's common and, and easy? Because if I create cubes in a common way, if I interrogate cubes in a common way, and I have common algorithms, boy, that's going to make it much easier for all of us. Otherwise, there's you know, a thousand different choices. Hello, GC. Um, picking up on what you just said with respect to essentially the difference between the open data cube as a functional architecture that's defined functionally uh, with interfaces and encodings, and in comparison to the CIOS data cube, which is the implementation uh, from an open source repository. Uh, there are other organizations that, like the concept of data cubes, have implemented what they call Earth Observation data cubes that don't use the CIOS implementation. Correct. I, I applaud the CIOS implementation. This is not a ding on what you've done at all. I applaud and hope you get 20, 25, 30, you know, it's all great. Mm -hmm. The question is federation around uh, mm -hmm. when you delimit that use of the open source and you talk about a functional architecture based upon interfaces and codings, is that of interest to the open data cube? I know it's of interest to GEO and GEOS and how do we get there? So I, I, 
I guess you're leaning towards you know OGC. Absolutely. Not and we are but certainly yeah. thinking along those lines. So one of the things we're doing uh, right now is developing a, a plugin for QGIS, which is a common GIS tool. On the client and, side. On the client yeah, side. And we are, are trying to do, if you have QGIS on your local machine and the cube is in the cloud, yeah. You have to now go through web mapping or, or WCS type service, and we're, we're trying to do that all through OGC standards. So, QGIS well, already is a compliant. It's already compliant. For WMS and right. WCS. So, if you speak WMS and WCS, then you've you're got already it. interoperable. Yeah. So, it seems like the change needs to happen on the server side and the CIOS open source to make it compliant to QGIS. I mean, QGIS is already there. True. Right. We want to do 20 countries in the next five years. And we're interacting with these countries, 30 of them. But you know, LC Map is another example of an implementation. USGS is looking at a data cube construct, and they're going to use a lot of the, the, the ODC way of doing it. But their implementation is slightly different because they're using a different database structure, and it's just, but it's generally the same concept. So they're part of our, our group as well. So I'll just uh, zip through a few of these, and you're going to hear more about these. Here's Columbia's case. 25,000 scenes, and they've been in operation since December of 2016. Uh, they just won a national award in the Columbia Society of Engineers this past May, and they're continuing to use it within IDM and the government, as well as the University of Andes. So it's really uh, working quite well. In a uh, Swiss case, Greg's in the back of the room, and he, he can tell you more about uh, what's happening in Switzerland. <coughs> they've been operational since this past summer. 4,000 scenes, a little smaller than Columbia, so that's uh, good for them. They have their own <laughs> website, Swiss Data Cube, and uh, they're moving along, and they've just been approved for a capacity building project in Georgia and Moldova. So here's one of my theories on how you get to 20 countries in five years. In this case, like uh, Greg Giuliani, they understand now how to use a Data Cube. They develop a capacity building project this is not something that I'm, I'm not going to Georgia or Moldova or initiating it. Greg is going to initiate it and make that happen. So if this starts to grow in that way, and there's several instances of this, uh, you're going to also hear from Miguel Morgado, who's doing a capacity building project in Uganda, and he's from the UK. So this is a case where we're not interacting with Uganda directly, but they see value in doing this and therefore are going to spread this out. Yes, sir. I applaud the national um, focus, um, and I hate to have a but or a however I'm going to say that. Um, many, many sustainability challenges are transboundary in nature, um, and uh, say we succeed at having every nation in a region where a transboundary sustainability challenge exists, um, are we just thinking of it as an interoperability problem? Uh, or, uh, you know, is all analysis going to be federated across that beyond access? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the interesting things about the Australian implementation is that we have done the whole continent, right? So we're lucky our continent is a country, um, but if we have everything from alpine areas to tropical jungle to desert, you know, everything on that continent. Um, I think that what we've got with Open Data Cube is the opportunity for each country to build their own if they wish, but I think we also need to build regional cubes. Uh, so let's do all of Africa, right? Let's do all of North America, not just the US, all of North America, let's do all of South America. Um, and that allows each country to, to maintain sovereignty and build their own version and do their own analysis, but for <coughs> global problems, SDG analysis, you don't want to be federating the answers from 200 data cubes. You actually want to do it over maybe three or four um, that actually cover the entire planet. Data is already available, so this is actually easy to do. You will probably need a supercomputer to do that for a whole continent, okay, which is why we're continuing to develop in Australia ODC that will be able to operate on a supercomputer in the cloud or on a desktop device, depending on the scale of your data cube. Quick progress. So they are installing this on a new computing system that they purchased, focusing on rice and water. Um, they're technologically, in terms of, you know, I would say that Switzerland picked this up the fastest, really quickly. They also will tell you they've got some pretty good computing knowledge and know how they're doing it. Columbia and Pilar's group have uh, picked this up, I'd say, sort of in the middle. 
they've had a few more challenges, but they're making great progress. Vietnam, probably a little bit lower. They have a lot of challenges and very few Python programmers and having to bring them up to speed on the data sets that are available and how they might get certain products. So it's great to see that we have these different levels of implementation because we're going to learn from each one of those. And once we get Vietnam going, we'll know how to do the next country that is fairly low on the knowledge scale. So that's, that's how we're moving along. So now let me show you what this looks like and the kind of products you can generate and some of the exciting end, end uh, game pieces. So we have this portal out there um, on Amazon. I just, uh, it's this big, long Amazon AWS. So I've got tiny URL. This user interface to pull up any one of these applications, any one of these cubes, go in, define your analysis, and produce some products. And I'm going to show you some examples of some of the products that can come out of this. So we developed this user interface for a couple reasons. Countries can install this. So in the case of, uh, I, I don't know if Greg installed this, but I, I believe, Pilar, you've installed this uh, user interface on top of your queue. It, it can all be adapted and modular and be installed anywhere on top of the queue. So what we did with this is we also have it modular for the applications. So we have written in Python these nine applications. Well, if the user has a different application, and I think in the case of Columbia, they've got a change detection for PCA, we don't have that application in our UI, but they can add it to the user interface module and run the same algorithm in the background. So the, U the UI, the user interface, just gives you this ability to graphically see things and to set up an analysis. Now, if you're a really good Python programmer, you probably don't use something like this. You know, a Python <coughs> person will use a, a Python notebook or something and do some hardcore programming line by line. But for people like me, I'd much rather see this because this is the better way for me to understand. So what kind of things can we do with this? Very popular is custom mosaic. So when you get optical data like Landsat, there's always clouds in the way, and this is a problem. So what do we do? How do we pull this together? And so there's a few different examples. You can take the most recent pixel in the time series stack. You can take a metoid, which is sort of a, um, it's a real pixel, but it picks a, a pixel somewhere in the stack that is the most representative of all the other pixels in the stack, and then a median is the one that tends to be kind of the smoothest looking one, and that's actually taking a midpoint spectral response for all of the bands in the series. But you got to remember that one, uh, it may represent a real pixel for a short time series, but in most cases, a longer time series, this median product is a, is a fabricated pixel, right? It doesn't give you a real piece of information. This is so, happening on the server side, this is not yeah, the portal. All, well, on the, the server side, it's create this uh, cloud filtered analysis, and you know how Landsat 7 has those beautiful bands through the middle of the data, and everything kind of looks crazy? You, so you get a lot of things, if I'm combining <coughs> some bands here, I might get, this is a scene edge. In this case here, the red in here are clouds, and there's a lot of different things that come out if I'm doing a short term um, cloud mosaic. So all I did here was just take three months worth of data, which is not a lot of uh, time, and created a mosaic. Well, what it did is it ended up, all the underlying scenes were 15 to 80% cloudy, but when I combine them together, I get 97% cloud free. But part of the problem with this image is that it doesn't look very clean because you've got a lot of problems with, um, you know, different, different timing. But if you did this analysis for six months to a year, you get a much better representation. Now you get into some exciting work. Um, the water applications, I think, are really tremendous what you can do here. A lot of this was started uh, in Australia. Australia has this algorithm called WOFS, uh, Water Observation from Space, W-O-F-S. It's a 23-step algorithm, goes through some of the bands. The key is that it looks at every pixel and says, how often is that pixel water? over time in the time stack. Well, if this time stack is, in this case here, you're looking at uh, 11 years worth of data over a lake in central, uh, this is in Kenya, Lake Baringo, and I want to know when that uh, pixel was water, notice what you get here. These red areas right here, one to five percent. These are real extreme events and likely cases where we just had a heavy rain event. The water stayed on the ground for a short period of time, disappeared. 
very short period of time, over 11 years, right? One to 5% could have just been a few months. Then you get cases here where the lake is maybe 20 to 50%. This could have been a flood event, high rate event that persisted for many years. And when you start to look at this in larger lake structures, I'll show you a more interesting one coming up for Lake Chad. It really gets quite interesting. So going that back to that Lake Baringo that you just saw, as you do this analysis, what you saw there was a time series. I'll go back again. This is a time series answer. It tells me how these pixels are responding over the entire time series. You can now go in through the analysis and look at every time slice over time and show the extent of the water. And what you start to see is this does really represent uh, major things that are happening. So there were extreme droughts um, in the Bringo region in 2009 having severe impacts on farming. That's, that was supposed to be 2009. You can see the Landsat bands, says, ah, oh, there's no data there. And look at the size of the lake, right? Extreme droughts. In this case, in 2013, extreme floods. And I just picked this stuff off of Google, just going out there and Googling and find out what happened to Lake Bringo over time. They had extreme floods in 2013. Look at the size of the lake boundary. And then here's a case over here. A lot of water dynamic change. So how does this product compare with other things out on the internet? So you've probably seen the Aqua Monitor and this uh, product from JRC. This is uh, the new uh, water product. So Pekel and then another one down here. I, I Look at the differences here. So I ran our case, this is 11 years. Took the JRC model, which goes from 84 to 2015. You can see the boundaries very similar because they're also looking at a percent of time and everything that's dark blue is permanent. So that's permanent water over 11 years and that's permanent water. And that structure is almost identical. And here's aqua monitor. So if you compare the far left to the far right, it looks pretty darn good. And actually it's up here. I blew it up. We're gonna look at a cube it sits right up here in the top of Cameroon, which is on the edge of the lake. And so this area provides water to millions of people. It has all kinds of issues over time. The lake has shrunk considerably. World Bank, when I showed this to them, was very interested in this. We're still trying to figure out how to get this into some of their projects in the region. So you can also do time series animations with the user interface. So this is time series on the left. It's stepping through 17 years, and what it's doing is it's applying this um, time frequency. So you'll start to see things change. The colors will change over time because it's the percent of time any pixel is water. And is it done yet? Not quite. Might be done now. I count all of the pixels in that square for every year. I say, how many pixels are water for this year? How many pixels of water for this year? Look what you see. Now this is going left to right. I started in 2006, so I ended up here in 2016. 2008, big fall off. This was a huge drought period. And it's very obvious in the, in the, um, the data that we have. So what you see here is this cycling. That's seasonal cycling, right? You'd expect to see more water during the rainy season, less water, cycles along, big drought, came down here and now you've got a new equilibrium. The difference between these is about 4,000 hectares in water covered over just that square portion of Lake Chad, which is a piece of the lake, it's not the whole lake, but we're, we also have some other data for the entire lake. There's a 10 year trend that says it's losing 1.4 hectares per day. Interesting stuff. You can do this with any water body. All you need is that time series stack. Here's a really interesting case. So if you take this uh, case, and we have this cube on the user interface, you go into Ghana, Africa, and you find this uh, black, this uh, We National Park and the Black Bolter River, and you do this analysis. <clears throat> this is a really interesting, and if this, you would look at this lake now and say, why is this not all blue? This should all be water. What's really cool about this is that it wasn't water. It's only water 20% of the time over 17 years. It's because in the middle of that 17 year time period, they built a dam. And they built the dam right here. And what happened is they built the dam. There's the river. That's the only permanent piece of water in the entire area. And they, as soon as they built the dam, the whole thing started to fill up. That whole valley filled up. And now that is the lake that's in existence. So when you look at the time series, you get, you really start to see this. But 
If I just do this and I say, well, why is that water only there 10 or 20% of the time in 17 years? It's because I think it was in 2009 they built the dam. So I'm going to show you the picture. There it is. So this is just if you were to get a really cool multi-dimensional plot. So this all looks strange as it's going, but let me show you what's happening. What's happening is this measure, this set of data here is traveling along this lake transect, which is a lake in Australia. So I'm going from this point to this point in the graph as I go from left to right. Then this direction is time. So what you're looking at is water quality. And it doesn't really matter the number, but what you see is the variability and change that's happening. Notice the difference in colors. Between 1987 to about 2000, most of the lake was redder, which was a proxy for a um, higher sediment values. Something happened around 2000, and it's generally cleaner. Notice this little line right here? That's a bridge. Notice that little line? That's a bridge. These two bridges show up and just skew the data, but that's basically taking the spectral response of the bridge. Well, that's going to be a pretty odd answer. But just looking at the water, and if I'm not mistaken, and Stuart, you may know the answer, I think what happened was they actually adopted a, uh, a water cleaning, a water quality project at about this time in 2000, and look at the difference. So imagine this now in something like a World Bank project, where all World Bank wants to do is verify that something they have done in their investment has reaped the solution they desire. And something like this is a perfect example. I've noticed a change. I look at my time series. The land is changing the way I expect it to change. The water is changing the way I expect it to change. This, to me, is really telling. This uh, Google Earth image over here, you notice some areas here where there's some dense vegetation, like trees, and some areas that have been cleared. Well, we found that if you apply this algorithm called CCDC, it was uh, Zoo and Woodcock, 2012, wrote this algorithm, CCDC, and it basically what it does, it takes a time series model, it fits all seven of the spectral bands in Landsat to a series of sine and cosine functions, because sine and cosine functions can cycle with the periodicity of the seasons. So what I want is, I know that I'm going to get seasonal variations in my spectral response. So if you fit these things, and then you're always going to get some spurious data time to time. Who knows what happened? A little bit of a cloud gets in the way or so forth. But what you will notice is these things called breaks. And the, the code detects when has that cycle of my spectral response made a significant change, and we call it a break. So for the agriculture community, there's this product. So you take a pixel, and what I do is I do an iterative algorithm, and I find out that pixel is either a portion bare soil, photosynthetic green, or non-photosynthetic, which is dead wood, or you know something that maybe was green and no longer. So I iterate on that pixel, and I come up with a color that fits in that spectrum to represent that pixel, and this is what that product looks like. So. The interesting thing here is that when you're looking at changes in vegetation or seasonal changes, you can really start to see the changes in the greenness and, and these variations. So this is that Lake Chad uh, figure from before. This is the Chari River entering into Lake Chad. This whole area here, lots of bare soil out there. There is just nothing out there. You'd expect some greenness along the river because anything where there's moisture, right, you're going to get some greenness. And as you get really close to the lake, a lot of greenness here. Non-photosynthetic is dead vegetation. And you'd also expect some of the dead vegetation <coughs> along the borders where the lake might have been wet and damp at one point, and then the water has receded and it leaves behind dry vegetation. There's no moisture to sustain it, so you get a lot of blue change. And we're looking at that one pixel in the middle. And this is that same product from before. And now let's look at that time series, what's happened. So, I'm cycling between, so if you look at these colors, if I go at any point in time, this pixel is a portion soil, a portion dry, or a portion green, right? Because I have to iterate in that little triangle. So, 
what we do is, when I iterate in the triangle, look what's happening here. As I go through seasonal variations, I get the greening up in the seasons. So all these variations here, this is a long time series, by the way. What I notice that I get all these variations, and then suddenly I get a lot more green. So I forget which direction it went. It went to something like a normal... Um, Wheat, wheat crop on the left, and wheat. Wheat, wheat crop, and then on the right it went to an almond plantation, which is a deciduous winter wheat crop. I need to remember that little thing. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna add that right, right here. I'm gonna put wheat, almond. Thank you. I've heard, I've heard Stuart present this one a bunch of times. I think it's a really cool plot, but it, again, it's that, it's that qualitative change, and not so much the quantitative piece, right? Which is the perfect language, and it's not. The language everyone would choose for every application but this particular case we thought this was the one that was uh, best served it utilizes a lot of um, a lot of libraries and a lot of powerful backbone tools so python is really uh, a good valuable asset to, to get your cube going we need to understand the user needs the very first thing we do if i talk with any country before i throw a cube in their direction or help them i want to completely understand so I, I, I apologize for being the only one to talk this entire time, but uh, I really appreciate the interaction. I thought that was great. If you have any ideas or thoughts about all of this and what we're doing, I would love to hear them. There's a lot of people here uh, knowledgeable about this, so 